Scares, man. We got Chilling Scares, man. Um, how's y'all motherfucking Sunday going? This is Mr. Ballin Sunday, but I want I ain't did no video Friday or Saturday, so I'm gonna hit y'all with two videos today. Um, thanks for showing love, all my new supporters. Thank y'all. Welcome to the family. Um, yeah, man. Uh, for you new supporters, just come in here, be respectful. You know what I'm saying? You, it's all right to have your own opinion. Um, open to opinion. Just don't get disrespectful over here. Oh, we're gonna have we're gonna have some people to send your ass out of here. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get into chilling scares, man. Um, and this is gonna be a late night reaction too. So let's go ahead and get into it, man. <clears throat> so way for the spaceman. On May 23rd, 1964, a British fireman named Jim Templeton took his wife Annie and his two kids, Elizabeth and Francis, to Berg Marsh, an area of grassland overlooking a famous estuary located off the southwest coast of Scotland. According to Jim, the only two other people in the marsh that day besides him and his family were two older women sitting in their car at the far end of the grassland. As an amateur photographer, Jim loved taking pictures of his kids, and so he took his camera on the day trip and photographed his five-year-old daughter Elizabeth wearing her brand new dress. The family spent the entire day enjoying the sunshine and taking family photographs, after which Jim took the pictures to be developed. But when he went to pick them up a week later, he noticed something had appeared on one of the pictures. Although most of the photographs seemed completely normal and featured his daughter enjoying the sunshine in her flowery dress, the chemist who developed the role mentioned to Jim that one of the pictures had unfortunately been ruined by a strange figure standing behind his daughter. When Jim himself analyzed the photo in question, he was sort of disturbed. Standing right behind his daughter in the grassland was the figure of what appeared to be a man in a spacesuit. This was pretty shocking to Jim, as he was 100% sure that there had been nobody else with him and his family at the marsh that day. Suspecting that maybe the- Oh, heck. No. <laughs> no, sir. Chemist had somehow altered the photograph. He sent it to Kodak for analysis, but a few days later they got back to him with confirmation that the photograph was genuine and hadn't been altered in any way. For some reason, Jim's first reaction was to go to the police, but understandably, they weren't interested in the case and immediately dismissed him. Determined to get the story out there, Jim then went to the owners of the local newspaper, who were a lot more interested in the story than the cops. The next day, the photograph of Jim's daughter was in every newspaper in Cumbria. The mysterious, unexplained image started gaining traction, and a few days later, the photograph of the little girl was now being featured in pretty much every newspaper in the world, with millions of people wondering where the spaceman had come from. As the photograph received more and more international attention, Kodak seized the opportunity for free publicity by launching a prize for anyone who could prove the photograph had been faked, but nobody could. While the photograph was being published by dozens of newspapers all over the world, a similar incident in Australia made the story explode even more. Just days after Jim took the now infamous photograph, a Blue Streak missile launch at the Woomera Test Range in South Australia was aborted after the missile technicians got spooked at the sight of two large men standing in the firing range. In a BBC interview, Jim alleged that when the technicians saw his daughter's photograph in an Australian newspaper, they claimed the figures they had seen on the firing range were identical to the spaceman in the photograph. Although this was never officially confirmed, Jim's allegations brought even more attention to the story when it was revealed that the Blue Streak missile whose launch had been aborted in South Australia had been built at a base very close to Solway Firth. As the story blew up, Jim mentioned that a few days after the photograph was published, two men in suits claiming to be UK government agents arrived at his door. According to Jim, the men refused to show him their ID, claiming that they were only identified as number 9 and number 11 by the government. Oh, no. Although he didn't buy this story, the men were extremely insistent that Jim take them to the exact spot where the photograph was taken. When they arrived, Jim mentioned to the two mysterious men in suits that when he took the photograph, he had not seen the spaceman in the marsh. Allegedly, as soon as he said that, the two men got back in their car and drove away abruptly, leaving him to walk home alone. In a later interview, Jim dismissed the men as frauds, who were probably just pulling his leg and were probably not involved with the government. Have you been suffering from the after effects of a car crash? The good news is, you're still entitled to a fu- <laughs> As you can imagine, while that thing too though, they really didn't have, you know what I'm saying? They really didn't have no, 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 
things, you know what I'm saying, to crop pictures like that too though. So you gotta think, they got, you gotta think about that too though. This is happening. People started speculating and coming up with all kinds of theories to explain the appearance of the mysterious spaceman in Jim's picture. After all, this did happen in 1964, at the very peak of the space race, and a lot of people were incredibly suggestible to the idea of life on other planets. For almost 50 years, people came up with all kinds of theories to explain the spaceman in the photograph, most of them relating to extraterrestrial life or a possible staging. But it wasn't until 48 years later in 2012 that a solid theory by a credible source finally came to light. According to Dr. David Clark, a social sciences professor at Sheffield Hallam University, the mysterious spaceman was really just Jim's wife, Annie Templeton, who had probably walked into the photograph without Jim noticing and turned her back to Jim at the exact moment he took the picture. If you look at some of the other photographs Jim took that day, you can see Annie was wearing a blue dress and had her arms exposed, which explains how she could end up looking like a spaceman if the photograph was overexposed. Because Jim's intention was to photograph his daughter and not his wife, it's very possible that Annie was out of focus in the picture, which made her dress and body look very white after the role was developed, almost like she was wearing a spacesuit. As for the dome-like helmet on her head, this was probably just a cloud over the moon, which is often visible during the daytime when it's in its waxing gibbous phase, which it was on that day. Although this is the most logical explanation, if you look up explanations for the Solway Firth Spaceman photo today, you'll still find literally thousands of blogs and videos with all kinds of outlandish theories about the image, with some of them even being pretty new. Considering all the information available today, it's very safe to say this image has been debunked. It doesn't show some mystery spaceman the family just hadn't noticed in person, or some other kind of extraterrestrial oh, life. However, the Solway Firth Spaceman photo will always be a classic in the bizarre images genre. Another mystery that's been solved is the easiest way to meet your daily nutrition goals, and that's with Factor. Factor is a meal delivery service that delivers keto, calories made by a team of for those who want to One of the meals I tried was the creamy potato pork chicken. Factor also has other options like snacks, smoothies, and well percent off your fruit sponsoring this video. And lived pretty much as every normal kid did at the time. He went to school, spent time with his family, played with his friends, and did chores around the house. But a few years later, a tragic incident changed his life forever. One day in June 1919, when Raymond was nine years old, he spent the morning with his friends at a local swimming hole. On their way home, they crossed the Pittsburgh, Harmony, Butler, and Newcastle Railway Bridge, where they spotted a bird's nest sitting on top of a pole. After daring each other to climb on top of the pole and count the birds inside the nest, Raymond stepped forward to take the dare and began climbing the pole. This is where things get a little dark. Unfortunately, the pole was connected to a live wire with over 25,000 volts of electricity. At some point during the climb, Raymond accidentally touched the coil, and you can probably guess what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened next? A couple of hours later, he woke up in the hospital where the doctors were shocked he'd even survived the incident. That's great. Sadly, Raymond's eyes were literally burned out, and the rest of his face, arms, and hands were also badly burned, leaving him looking, unfortunately, less human. After an incident like that, a lot of people would completely give up on life, but not Raymond. She. As soon as he was discharged from the hospital, he learned braille and started weaving doormats, wallets, and belts as a way to make some extra cash. In his nephew's own words, he never discussed his injuries or problems at all. It was all just a reality, and there was nothing he could do about it, so he never spoke about it. He never complained about anything. All throughout the rest of his childhood, and well into his adult years, Raymond loved listening to the radio during the day, and going on long walks along Route 351 at night, sometimes for hours at a time. When rumors started spreading in Beaver County about a man without a face walking the streets of Pennsylvania in the dead of night, the locals did everything they could to catch a glimpse of him. Even though he mostly avoided contact with strangers out of fear. Haven't we seen this photo before? We seen that photo before. I, I, I think I've seen this photo before. I think. Of scaring people, they always ended up finding him. Although most of the locals were just curious to meet him and make friends with him, others abused him pretty brutally for no reason, sometimes offering him rides and dropping him off far away from home, hitting him with their cars, and even physically beating him. 
But even with all the abuse, Raymond refused to let it get to him and continued. I'm not gonna lie, bro. We got some evil people in this world. There's some evil people in this world, bro. I ain't gonna lie. Like, that's, that's top tier lane. It may have already been through a lot, you feel me? And back then, I mean, I can understand. They ain't 1990, they probably didn't have, they ain't have shit to do for fun. Like, the shit that we got now, they ain't have none of that back then. So, uh, that's climate, climate, you know what I'm saying? The next song, well, he should have known better not to climb no vultures, though. I ain't gonna lie. Like, that's that, what? Going on his walks for several decades. I used to do block crazy shit. Even know. though Raymond was obviously a real person and a pretty nice guy, according to everyone who met him, an urban legend quickly grew around him while he was still alive, which earned him the nicknames Charlie No Face and Green Man. According to the legend, Charlie No Face was a sort of ghoul or boogeyman who walked the streets of Pennsylvania at night, looking to terrorize anyone who crossed paths with him. Though. Man, y'all know when I took my hair, that's why my hair got shorter because I didn't, I got, I ain't take it out. Y'all know my hair was longer than this. I ain't gonna lie. I got it. So I got to go back through this stage all over again. You feel me? So y'all be with me on the journey. You feel me? Y'all be seeing how long my hair be going and shit, bro. Now I got to let it grow again. It's crazy. Off topic though. A lot of people didn't believe it and chunked it up to another urban legend that didn't carry any truth whatsoever. However, some people who found him walking the streets took images of him, which took the urban legend to a whole new level. But still, a lot of people thought the images were fake, when in reality they were 100% real, only the legend behind them wasn't. Even though the real Raymond Robinson died in 1985, people have continued to carry the legend to this day, spreading rumors about alleged sightings of a terrifying monster with no face haunting the streets of Beaver County. As you can imagine, the locals have put their own twist on the story through the decades, with some people claiming Charlie No Face intentionally ripped off his own face just to scare people at night, and others alleging he fell into a vat of acid. Although the myth of Charlie No Face checks pretty much all the boxes of a traditional urban legend, this is one of those rare cases where it actually carries some truth. You could really find Raymond walking the streets at night looking like he did in the images taken of him. Only he wasn't looking to scare or harm anybody, but rather simply go on a walk. Despite all the crazy rumors and the obviously fake stories people made up about him, Raymond Robinson's story is a strong reminder to live life to the fullest, no matter your circumstances. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Cannabis. It's not just legal in 38 states. It's a $36 billion global... How safe really is your neighborhood? You probably don't even know about half the crimes that go on around your neighborhood, but you can check this safety map. The Amityville Ghost Boy. In December 1975, George and Kathy Lutz moved into their new home at 112 Ocean <laughs> Avenue in Amityville, New York. Not gonna lie. Scary movie that scared me. Well, I, there's only two, two or three scary movies that can really just scare me. The old it. No, it's full scare. It's full scare movie that scare me. The dentist. If y'all ever seen the dentist, that's scary. It's about a dentist, a serial killer. That's a dentist. The dentist. Antiville. That's the original one and the, and the new ones. Scare me. Oh 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 oh. Insidious. The first and the second one. I, you know, I love Insidious. The whole franchise. I love it. And let me see what else. A fourth movie that scared me to death. It don't scare me, but you know what I'm saying. I be having jump scares like a motherfucker. Uh, Pet Cemetery, but I, I love Pet Cemetery though. It, like movies that creep me out, but Annabelle, them jump scares in that movie is fucking different. I ain't gonna lie. I'm, <laughs> Just 40 miles from New York City, the what five bedroom Dutch colonial house was George and Kathy's dream home, especially since they only had to pay $80,000 for it. If the price seems too good to be true, that's because it was, and George and Kathy were well aware that the house had been vacant for a year after the last family who lived at 112 Ocean Avenue had been violently murdered. In November 1974, hey. just a... For my females, females and males, will y'all move in the house if y'all know somebody got murdered in there? That one, and the sinister too. The sinister, I forgot to add the sinister. The sinister, if y'all haven't seen the sinister, go watch it. Sinister one and two, go watch it. It's kind of like this right here. <laughs> Not gonna lie, it's kind of basically like a little bit. 
For a year before the Lutzes moved in, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr. brutally murdered his family in their sleep, triggering a long, dark, and confusing court case that concluded with more questions than answers. Despite the home's history, the Lutzes were thrilled to be moving in. But their joy was short-lived, for less than a month later, they abruptly left the home with all their belongings inside and never returned, claiming that the house was haunted by evil spirits. When asked about what happened at the house, George mentioned that ever since they moved in, they had been consumed by intense mood swings and dark emotional episodes where he would start to feel an intense sense of hatred towards his family. The family also alleged that they had seen a mysterious green slime oozing down from some of the walls at random times throughout the day, and had even been waking up almost every night at exactly 3.15 a.m., the same time the previous family had been murdered before they moved in. In one particularly disturbing incident, George claimed that one night when he was standing on the front lawn, he saw a half-man, half-pig creature with red eyes staring down at him from one of the upstairs windows. According to the priest who had blessed the house after the Lutzes moved in, on the day of the blessing, he had allegedly heard a male voice shouting at him to get out of the house, and in the days following his visit to the Lutzes' home, he claimed to have fallen ill with blood seeping out of his hands. After leaving the home, the Lutzes wrote a book about their experience, which went on to inspire countless horror movies, including the original 1979 The Amityville Horror, the 2005 remake of the same movie featuring Ryan Reynolds, and The Conjuring 2, which revolved around Ed and Lorraine Warren's investigation of the only haunted house at 112 Ocean Avenue. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine Warren founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. For 50 years, the couple ran a well-known paranormal investigations operation with set The Conjuring, I like it a little bit. Insidious, The Conjuring, uh, I'm gonna I'm a choose, I'm a choose Insidious. I love Insidious, but The Conjuring good as fuck too, though. Definitely, The Conjuring good, bro. Several of the cases they investigated serving as the inspiration oh, the for movies such as Annabelle and The Haunting What's in that? Connecticut. Five months after the Lutz family left the house on Ocean Avenue, the Warrens conducted an investigation. My bad, last time Paul. But that's that's like them only two movies, like only two movies I can't say with, with ghosts and shit I fuck with, or paranormal activity. I, I love parent. The whole paranormal activity franchise I love. You feel me? I love all. That. I love of the house, during which they alleged that all kinds of creepy things happened to them, none of which were caught on camera. Though, during the investigation, Ed and Lorraine captured a photo of what appears to be a child with creepy, glowing eyes poking his head out of the basement door, which you've very likely seen before, as it's gone on to become one of recent history's most infamously creepy photos We're since saying, it was captured back in 1976. Although the Warrens and their fans promoted the theory that the boy in the image was the spirit of John DeFeo, who was around the same age as the boy in the creepy picture at the time his brother murdered him, the reality is a lot less dark and exciting. During their investigation, the Warrens were assisted by Paul Bartz, another investigator. And if you look at some of the pictures of Bartz from that night, you'll notice he was wearing a plaid shirt, very similar to the one worn by the supposed ghost boy. As it was later discovered, despite the Warrens' claims, the boy in the picture was not actually a boy at all, but Paul Bartz kneeling on the floor and taking some measurements. The creepy glare of his eyes was caused by the reflection of his glasses, and not by some strange demonic force as the Warrens claimed in later interviews. Okay. As of 2024, much, if not all, of the alleged haunting that took place at the house on Ocean Avenue in 1975 has been debunked. It's in still fact, up. in the public view, many people remember Ed and Lorraine Warren as charlatans and scammers it's who did some pretty messed up stuff at the height of their power. That, along with the photo being proved as a setup, is almost conclusive evidence that nothing was really going on here, and everything claimed to have happened was a straight-up lie. Since the Lutz is left in early 1976, the house has been sold four times, and not a single one of the new buyers has complained about any kind of paranormal activity at 112 Ocean Avenue. I guess people will goddamn buy houses and be murdered. Hey, if your partner is being secretive with their phone, you need to do this now. Most people... A million miles from ordinary, but just a short drive away, is Wild Adventures, where you can... Her family falling body. This image of a happy family sitting around a dinner table while a dark, creepy shadow in what, what appears to be fuck? some sort of dress hanging upside down over the centerpiece. What the fuck is that? What the fuck? 
It's been reposted all over the internet for the past decade, often as part of collections like Top 10 Unexplained Disturbing Photos. The alleged backstory of the strange image in question goes that at some point in the 1950s, the Cooper family bought an old house in Texas and moved into it. On their first night there, Mr. Cooper took a photo of his wife and mother posing with his two kids at the dining room table, with everyone smiling and in apparently good spirits. A few days later, after picking up the photograph from the chemist who developed it, they were shocked to see what appeared to be the shadow of a body hanging from the ceiling and over the dining room table. According to the family, the strange figure had not been present at the time the picture was taken, otherwise they definitely would have noticed it. Yeah. As the story goes, they were never able to find out who or what had invaded their beautiful family portrait. Some sources claim that one of the chemists developing the film threw a negative from a separate photo of the famous ballerina Margot Fontaine over the original and played with the exposure to get a creepy effect and play a prank on the family. At least, that's the story you'll find in the videos that feature the infamous photo. However, through my research, I was able to find that the entire story is completely fake. Oh. Pretty much from start to finish, the story of the Cooper family is completely made up, and it's very likely that the image itself was digitally altered in Photoshop or some other editing software. From what I found, the first time the photograph was posted online was back in 2009 when a user named Sam Cohen uploaded it under the title Family Gathering to a site called Ligati.net, a fan website for the famous horror writer Thomas Ligati. Interestingly, Sam Cohen categorized the photograph as art, which suggests the picture was digitally fabricated as part of some sort of art project. Other details in the image itself seem to back this up, including the symmetrical dark spots in the corners of the image, which were probably edited using Photoshop to make the photograph look authentic. It's possible that the photograph of the family was taken back in the 50s, and that someone digitally superimposed a shadow on the image several decades later as a part of an art project, but there's also a possibility that the photograph of the family is fake as well. It's unknown if Sam Cohen was the original creator of the image, but a few months later, user Xavier Ortega posted it to the site Ghost Theory as a part of a gallery he titled Retro Creeps, Scary Portraits from the Past. After his post, some people reached out to Xavier to ask him if he was the original creator of the image, but he claimed he didn't know anything about its origin. What the fuck is that? Over the next couple of years, the image started gaining traction online and was reposted in every online forum you can imagine. By 2013, Family Gathering had become one of the most infamous, unexplained, creepy photos on the internet, which led people to start coming up with stories to give context to the disturbing image. After it was featured on dozens of YouTube videos, most people assumed the story behind it was real. But all the evidence suggests that the image was digitally altered using Photoshop, and people just wrote a credible story to go along with it. Yeah. Still, for all the information we have that points to the fact that the image is totally fake, it's likely that Family Gathering will continue to be a big hit in the online horror community for many years to come. I ain't gonna lie. That, that, that story is crazy. I ain't gonna lie to you. I just, I was sitting here thinking about, I didn't do no video, I, I did, I, I ain't even do no video Friday or Saturday for y'all. So, when this video drop, and when y'all get done watching this video, another video gonna drop probably an hour or two hours after. So, y'all be on the lookout, y'all gonna have three videos on this good Mr. Bowman Sunday. That being said, see you when I see y'all, let's ride, nigga, and make sure y'all hit that thumbs up like subscribe. Time is a